thank you for tuning in to our present series of programs entitled My Story. I'm going to actually interview two people during this program. The first person is going to be David Smith, who comes from a Protestant background. And the second person is going to be Seamus O'Connor, who comes from a Republican background. And I want you to see how God has dealt with these two men in a remarkable way, but actually in a similar way. So, David, it's good to see you and thank you very much for coming to be interviewed. Would you just tell me a little bit about your background? You were born in 1960 and brought up in a normal Protestant religious background. Thank you, Terry. Uh, and it's my privilege to be here to share my story. Um, my name, as you know, is David Smith and uh, spelt S-M-Y-T-H, and that will explain itself later. Uh, as a child, I was born into what would be, in Northern Ireland, a normal uh, Unionist, Protestant, traditional religious background, because that's what most Protestant people are in the North of Ireland. And uh, I'm one of three children. My mother and father both uh, are believers. And uh, as a young child, I grew up around people who were involved with uh, Orange Order and that type of thing. And uh, during my childhood years, I experienced some uh, of the troubles, bombs going off in the town and where I came from. There were quite a number of explosions and there was some activity going on. And from a very early age, I really picked up that there was two types of people in Northern Ireland. There were Protestants and Catholics. And as I grew, uh, I started to think, you know, really, we must be the good guys. And these Catholics must be the bad people. And then in the schooling system, there was the Catholic schools and there was the Protestant schools. So there was always a difference. You had the chapel and you had the churches and you had uh, differences everywhere you turned. So from an early age, I started to form this opinion and be shaped and molded into a way of thinking. And sad to say, as I grew up, I started to, I suppose I allowed myself to become a vessel uh, to be filled with dislike at the beginning. And then that dislike turned to deeper dislike and then hatred for my Catholic neighbours. And uh, to that, I, I'm ashamed now of that. But at that time, I, I thought that was pretty normal. So this was your environment. This is how you were brought up. Uh, what was your first career plan? What was the job you wanted to do? Well, I was, I was actually brought up in a farming background. Uh, and I hadn't really a career plan mapped out or thought about. Uh, I started off uh, as a young man as a motor mechanic and I quite enjoyed that. And then I got married. And it uh, changes most of us. It changes the most of us. And, and demands uh, came on in relation to the cost of living and, and wanting to do better. And I always had this. Uh, desire to be a, a protector or a defender of the good folk. So I applied for the police and I joined the RUC in 1984. Right. And uh, having done your training, where would you have been operational? Well, I was sent to County Londonderry as my first uh, station. And uh, really, that was for me a prime opportunity to uh, protect innocent people. And you know, I was influenced by seeing things like news reports, and I would have seen people who are maybe quite famous now appearing in those news reports, and in those days they were looked upon as being very bad people, and you would hear comments passed, and uh, you would hear of things happening, people being killed, and and uh, the, the bad guys were never caught. but whenever people from the unionist uh, background did evil things, they were caught and you could never understand. There was always this 
how come our boys get caught and the other boys don't get caught and so I was very much shaped into thinking that way and uh, as I served in the police I served from that position and wasn't a very pleasant And person. you were involved in obviously some very unpleasant events, even being injured yourself. Yes. Just would, a little bit of background of that kind yeah. of experience. Yes, um, it was uh, a case when I served in the RUC at times, uh, some of the people that went out on patrols, uh, we split up and went our different directions and on occasions where some didn't come back and uh, some of us did and very thankful for that. And uh, there was occasions when uh, incidents took place and, and really there was, there had to be a divine protection over uh, my own life. I knew there was. In 1980, you um, experienced two bereavements which had an impact on your life. Yes, that in actual fact happened before I joined the RUC. Right. And um, there was, I was married uh, about a year and in the first year of marriage there was two deaths took place in my family. Um, my wife's father died and uh, my grandmother died. Now my grandmother was my role model. She was the one who I would say if ever someone was Christ-like, she was Christ-like. Yeah. And I had a great admiration for her. And that was whenever I felt challenged. It was actually at her funeral. When I looked into the open grave, I was challenged by the words, if you were to die, uh, would you ever see your grandmother again? And that really played on my mind to the point where I invited the Lord Jesus Christ into my life. And did that make a dramatic change? It made a fantastic change. However, at that time, I wasn't aware that I required more than just a change. I needed to be trans, uh, transformed, restored. I needed to be the man that God wanted me to be. Where did the change begin to take place then? Because obviously you knew, you knew somehow that there, needed, there was more and you didn't have what you really wanted. Yes, well, I would have to say, and, and uh, I think it's best that I explain it, for years, and this sounds silly, but for years I, I was convinced that God was a Protestant and uh, that the sun only really shone on the Unionist people. And uh, I served uh, as a protector of those folk. And in doing that, I caused hurt and pain to people from the uh, Roman Catholic background. And at this point, I would just like to take this opportunity once again, as I have done in public before, and apologize for any hurt or pain that I have caused any person on the island of Ireland, regardless of your religious background or whoever you may be. Um, so so um, you were the protector of the prods and uh, you felt that uh, obviously the Catholics were the enemy almost. Yes. But then you experienced some problems at Drum Cree which uh, were not exactly what you expected. No, that would be right. Um, whenever the first Drum Cree occurred, uh, I thought as a Protestant, I thought as a Unionist, I thought as a, a British citizen, I thought as all those things, and I, um, I couldn't understand really. There was, there was things happening that weren't comfortable. And um, I got really confused whenever I seen that the people who I thought were the good people and the people I had protected for years started to actually rebel and turn against us. And I can remember it very well, uh, standing just with a fence between myself and perhaps thousands thousands of people and uh, people would come down to that wire and from from the town that we lived in and identify us and then they would uh, openly threaten us across the, the wire and I I couldn't understand that why would someone that I had protected for years want to burn my house why would they want to kill my kids why would they want to uh, harm my wife or, or children and and uh, I, I started to become disillusioned and confused 
and you had um, a journey really into deep depression. Yeah, that, that was the start of a, a very bad journey for me. Uh, I uh, was injured sometimes, uh, there was a lot of public disorder at that time and on occasions we were attacked by uh, numbers of a thousand against 30 police and on one occasion I had a very serious injury uh, not realising even then how serious it was uh, when a man had climbed onto a, a, a riot Land Rover and dropped a field boulder down and uh, it hit me on the helmet that I was wearing mm -hmm. and uh, caused me a lot of physical damage to the point where I had to have serious uh, surgery for spinal injury etc. This led you to a stage where you say, God, are you there? In regard to God, I suppose I had walked away from God at that point, and uh, I wasn't walking with God the way I ought to be, and, and I started to become a very, very bitter person. The man that had begun hating Catholics was then starting to hate everything and every person. Um, my whole life began to unravel and uh, I'd done things and tried to drown out problems in all different ways which only caused more pain and more hurt to myself and to my family and friends. So really you're summing up your situation even though you had made a commitment to follow Christ, you'd actually lost your way. Yes. and had begun to uh, really get filled up with this hatred yeah. uh, and unforgiveness and you had no peace whatsoever. That would be absolutely true. I had no peace. I was full of hatred, full of anger. Um, I was full of hurt, uh, full of uh, betrayal. Yeah. I had been involved in a few things where uh, even my own colleagues let me down and I took that very personally and uh, things just went from bad to worse. We're going to end this part of the interview yep. but I think you would probably want to say that at this stage you cried out again to God. That would be right. I had a, an amazing experience where I was invited to attend a church uh, which I had never been in before, uh, a place where I had uh, didn't know the preacher and had even joined in in the gossip against the man at times and had never met him. However, uh, I went along to that service just the once and I had an amazing encounter with God, an amazing encounter. <laughs> This is the second part of our interview. We first spoke to David and he was telling us of his experience coming from the uh, Protestant point of view. We're now going to speak to Seamus O'Connor. Seamus, it's lovely that you've been able to join with us. You come from a nationalist Republican background. Perhaps you could explain what that means and just give us a little bit about your early life. Hmm. Well, my name's Seamus O'Connor and I'm 54 years of age and uh, I was born into a, a Catholic, Republican, nationalist family. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean by Republican is I don't recognize the Queen or monarchy. Uh, from a nationalist point of view, um, we would be Ireland United Gaelic and Free People. So um, it's, it's, and from a Catholic point of view, that's uh, the religion, the faith that I was brought up in. Right. And uh, you started off, was it County Derry? Yeah, I'm from County Derry, yeah. What sort of background, you, uh, your family and...? Uh, my mother and father are still alive and I have two sisters, one's older and one's younger. And um, my mother and father are still, as I say, living and uh, uh, healthy and, and uh, That's great. have a real zest for life. And as a teenager, you went into becoming a joiner? I left school, yeah. I had a very, very happy childhood and two very good, loving parents. 
and um, I went to secondary school and uh, I left there and I began work as a workshop joiner. But you also had other activities taking place in the evenings and in your spare time. I had, yes. Um, as opposed to growing up, um, I was very aware of the, the, the troubles that had uh, were going on at the time. Mm. Uh, very aware, I remember the civil rights marches. Very aware of, uh, you know, when people would be, say, talking about what was happening. And would you have been part uh, of these marches? Uh, no, I was too young for that. Right. Um, Sorry about that. But, <laughs> but I remember them very, very well, mm. so I do. And just hearing talk about, you know, job discrimination, uh, you know, um, where housing was being given out to, you know, Protestant people and uh, just discrimination right across the board yeah. against Catholic people. Yes, and uh, so it's difficult for you to describe some of the things you were involved in, but uh, at 17 years old, you found yourself arrested. Yes, that's right. I'm not asking too much about what you did or how you did it, but uh, that must have been a very traumatic experience for a 17-year-old. Well, you know, at that time, a lot of my neighbours and from and the area that I was from, South Derry, um, a lot of the neighbours were arrested, a lot of them were put in prison. Uh, and it, so, you know, it wasn't um, a big deal for me, to be truthful with you. Um, because, as I say, a lot of my neighbours were, were in prison, a lot of my friends were imprisoned. I mean, we, we would uh, hear that the, you know, the British government and the Protestants would regard you as, uh, um, you know, as terrorists. How would you have described yourself? I would have described myself as a freedom fighter. Yeah. Um, someone who uh, opposed uh, the British rule. Uh, someone who uh, opposed uh, discrimination, someone who opposed uh, just everything that was wrong uh, with the system. So you would have called yourself the good guys? That's right. Rather than the, the Protestants? Um, I would have seen the, the UDR and the, the police as uh, the terrorists. Uh, they were the ones who were upholding the, the rule of law, which w was to me discrimination and discriminatory against uh, the Catholic people. So you landed up in prison and you were there for about seven years. That's right, yeah. Didn't, wasn't a holiday camp, was it? Certainly not. Uh, that was 1976 when so I went into prison mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the troubles were at their height at that time. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of tension within the prisons. Uh, I got sentenced and uh, I joined the blanket protest. I spent a number of years in the blanket protest and that was a very, very harsh, brutal regime. So it was. Just explain what that is, because a lot of people would have not have been the generation that would have known about that. Well, the British government uh, saw us as uh, terrorists and criminals and we didn't accept that. So uh, when we were sentenced, uh, rather than wear uh, the criminal uniforms and conform to the, the prison way of life, we refused to do so and we went on protest. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't wear the uniforms and uh, uh, we went on uh, dirty protest as well. So that really caused a lot of anger from your prison officers and so on as well, I suppose. So Very much so. Very, Very much so. so what uh, what was the outcome of that from you, from a, a personal point of view? Um, during that period of time, as I say, it was a very brutal regime, and out of it, I, I suffered from from a very very deep depression, and uh, I was diagnosed with uh, post traumatic stress disorder. Yes, and so uh, when you came out of prison. You know, after serving your sentence, you must have found it very difficult to readjust to normal life? I found it very difficult, yeah, very difficult. And um, fair enough, I got out on a Monday and I started work on a Tuesday again, yeah. back to my old job as a, a workshop joiner. But um, yeah. the depression and uh, the anxiety and the fears that, that come with the, 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 the depression still haunted me. And During that time, me. you met your wife and 
That's were right. married or had you met your wife before? No, no. I no. met my wife uh, no. after I got released from prison, yeah. And uh, even that didn't lift you out of it for more than a short period of time, uh, I suppose. Right? That is right, yeah. Yeah. And you had some children? I had three children, yeah. And the depression uh, and this um, really impacted your family? Big time. Big time. Just a little bit, just some, maybe for people to understand where yeah, you came from. Some people would say, you know, um, when they hear of someone with depression, you know, they need to give themselves a good shake. But depression is, a, is an illness and it can have a serious and devastating impact on a person mm -hmm. from a point of view of, um, you know, there's days that you feel very withdrawn. There's days that you just don't want to communicate with people. There's days that you'd be angry, frustrated. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of emotions goes on there. So as a result, you were separated from a, for a time from your wife and your children? That's right. And uh, really had a, a very, very, very difficult period. A song had an impact. Which song was that? Well, for years I had been receiving treatment for the post-traumatic stress disorder, as they called it. Mm -hmm. And I was maybe on 12 tablets a day. Uh, I had been in uh, a mental uh, hospital at one time, and on a couple of occasions I had received electric shock treatment to the brain. And none of that seemed to work or have mm -hmm. any sort of uh, an impact on my life. Mm -hmm. And then I was all alone, and uh, I was in one of those dark, dark places at the time. And I remember just uh, putting on a song, and it was uh, Simon Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Mm -hmm. And um, the words of that song, you know, if you ever listen to them when you're yeah. weary and feeling low and that, those words started to speak to me. And it was as if, you know, that's the place that I was at at the time. And yet they were not even a Christian song. No. Beautiful words, mm -hmm. yes. And mm -hmm. So what happened as you listened? As I listened to that, uh, you know, to the words of that, you know, and it talked about bridge over troubled water, I saw Jesus as my bridge over those troubled waters. And it impacted me. And are, you, I, are you able to elaborate that at all? Or yeah, how did you feel it? I just burst out crying. I burst out crying yeah. because I had never... Um, thought about it before. Uh, I had never experienced anything like the feeling that I had. Because you didn't come from a, um, a religious background, did you? No, far from it. I never had, uh, let's say, any experience of the Bible or Bible teaching or anything like that. I was brought up in a Catholic uh, home, Catholic tradition, went to the chapel and uh, said my prayers and tried to be live as good a life as I could. Mm -hmm. but, but Jesus kind of became real to you, even though you couldn't describe how it really happened. At that moment. Yeah, at, at that, that moment. moment yeah, yeah I, I could say Jesus became real to me. And I can just imagine almost a shock though, wasn't it? It uh, was. That somehow he's come into your life and you don't really know much about him. That's right. I, at, at the time, I didn't understand what was going on, and uh, it was such a, a, a shock to me, but it was such a good feeling. And a few days later, something unusual happened again? Uh, a few days later then, um, a, a, an ex-Republican prisoner came to visit me, and uh, he had been in the monastery in Port Lanon, and uh, he brought me a Bible. And of course that made a lot of sense. <laughs> it made no sense to me whatsoever. And, uh, but uh, upon you know, receiving that, I did uh, open the Bible and I, I did look through it and read it, but a lot of it didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. But as you began to dig deeper, so things became clearer. Yeah, right? yeah. As, as days and, and weeks and, and even months and, and, and uh, a couple of years progressed, you know, there was things that were impacting my life. And I suppose one of the biggest things that impacted my life was um, uh, my, my uh, let's say, my relationship with, with, with God, where I was um, now able to 
talk to God in a, in a just in a, in a normal way, whereas, you know, before I'd have been saying prayers that were repetitive and that, but I was speaking to God as, as, as if in a personal relationship now. Had you begun going to a church? I hadn't, not for, for a couple of years. And uh, then I, I ventured one time to uh, a church that was non-denominational. Uh, it was over in Tubbermore. And uh, uh, it was uh, the first time that you know I entered it and I, I really heard the gospel being preached and, and uh, I had good teaching there for a couple of years. And so this experience of Jesus being the bridge became a reality in your life? It became a reality in my life and um, you know I can remember one time when I was praying and, and I was down on my knees and I was just thanking God for you know what he was doing in my life and how he was changing things around for me and uh, I can remember uh, just like a picture of this person came into my mind as I was praying and this was a person who had um, uh, made a false allegation against me, falsely accused me of something that had really hurt me and, mm -hmm. and I was really felt bitter towards this person for years and uh, I started to cry and I started to say, God, please forgive that person, forgive that man, because I forgive him. And that, that something happened to me. And uh, I knew something had, had really broken, and it was as if the cloud of depression and anxiety and fear and darkness was taken away from me there and then. Seamus, it's just lovely to hear this story. We're going to uh, have a further program when you will meet together with David and we'll hear more of the journey that you've taken in your walk with God. We just say to anyone who is listening to this program, you have seen or heard, both seen and heard, uh, two different men coming from two different backgrounds who found that the only real release that they ever got was when they met Jesus Christ. And we're just saying to you, he can meet you at your point of need and he can touch your life too. We trust that you'll tune in to the next uh, My Story program and I hope that you'll hear more of the journey that David and Seamus have taken together. Thank you for listening.